inspired by a single sentence. It was a question from last week's table, uh, no, last meeting's table <coughs> topics, and it was, how would you describe America to a foreign friend? Imagine you were the speaker, and if you hear, what would you say? Me? I had thousands of things to say, but I was too shy to speak. <laughs> so now I'm here, and it may sound weird, but I'm here to describe America to Americans. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but would it be interesting to hear from different point of view? So I would like to start my expectation versus reality of America. <laughs> expectation one, if I come to America, I will have parties all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say parties, what I imagined was luxurious parties, like the one in the movie The Great Gatsby. <laughs> so a huge house of a millionaire, where there's an outdoor pool, where I can wear a cocktail dress and have champagne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or club parties, where there are loud musics, a disco mural on the ceiling, colorful lights, crazy people dancing. So when I heard Americans have lots of parties, that's what I thought. <laughs> and reality is, you may know, I had lots of parties, but the concept of party was a little bit different than what I thought. I was invited to someone's house. There was lots of food, lots of beer, and while holding a can of beer, I was talking with a bunch of different people. Some of them I met, some of them I've never met before. So it was more like a social gathering than a crazy festival. <laughs> Expectation number two, America is big. Okay, I know, this is not an expectation, it's a true fact. America is the third biggest country in the world. I knew it, but I didn't thought, I didn't think that it might be this big. <laughs> Consider where I came from. I came from Korea. Do you know how big Korea is? I searched last night. And Korea is about the same size of Florida. So I came from literally a little country to a 98 times bigger country. There's so much space over here. I was amazed to see how big was a parking lot at Walmart. <laughs> I didn't have to worry to hit another car while I was parking because there was much more than enough space. <laughs> if you are parking in Korea, you'll have to let the passenger get out of your car before you park, because after you park, the passenger wouldn't be able to get out. <laughs> Expectation number three, gun violence everywhere. That was the scary part before I came to US. But the reality is, Nope, I've never seen one. I've never heard any. Maybe I'm in a safe area, or maybe I was too scared of. But <coughs> I noticed some cultural differences because people can carry guns. It was, it happens on my first week in US. I was <coughs> driving to Frederick downtown and I accidentally got <coughs> a one-way street <laughs> on the opposite direction. <laughs> and I immediately knew it because a car was coming in front of me in a different direction. And to make matters worse, that car was a police car. <laughs> I was pulled over, I rolled my window down, and what I did next made the police officer yell at me. What are you doing? What are you looking for? I was leaning toward the passenger side, oh, no. looking for my driver's license in my purse. I didn't know that I have to put my hands on the steering wheel, and I didn't know 
that policeman might think that I was looking for a gun. So it was a simple example to know the cultural differences that I never saw before. So these are some of my perceptions from a year experience in the US. And I learned that what I thought of America before is very different from what really is. And maybe because the, most of my expectations came from the movies or social medias. So you maybe might have some perceptions of a specific country or a specific area or a specific person. Maybe you're right but it's always good to know that reality might be different from what you think. I had a same moment as you were explaining in Chicago. Someone, I was in the peer, peer pro, whatever they call it, and then they asked her, why are you parking here? Why are you just uh, driving by here? And then I was gonna take my license and they said, Grace, just simply put your hands up. <laughs> okay. All right, next speaker, Jerry Stevens, his manual is Matthew's Dynamic Leadership again. And he's doing evaluation and feedback. And his title is, it's not a book club, it's a book study. <laughs> surveyed our membership to discover amongst us. In 17 survey responses, we have collectively read over 41 books in the last 10 months. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. Larry lost count. He read so much, he ran out of fingers and toes. But 41 books is an immense amount of knowledge amongst us. I personally am an avid reader as well. And when I read self-help books, I like to do it with other people. I like to be challenged to continue to try to implement what was in the book and use it in my own personal life to improve upon myself. I've taken part in no less than 10 book studies, four of which I was a participant, six of which I was either a leader or an organizer. In my experience with book clubs, unfortunately, they tend to fall a little bit flat. Our expectations are that everybody's gonna show up, everybody's gonna read, everybody's going to participate. The reality, along Unlu's lines, is something utterly different. In my experience, at least 25% of people fall out of book clubs, and generally the discussions are somewhat like, well, pulling teeth. That is, except for the last book club that I was involved in, it was transformational. And that book club was transformational because of the platform that it was done on. It was done on an app known as Voxer. Now Voxer solved some of the participation problems that I think many of us have experienced in book clubs. The participation problem in book clubs is oftentimes not only that there is a schedule that's hard to keep up with, not only reading but attending a meeting, but many people are afraid of speaking up. Even in small groups, when maybe you're on the phone or in a small group of friends that are reading the same book. Voxer solves the participation problem. Voxer allows people to participate how, when, and wherever they want. Let's talk about the how. Voxer is an app 
have it in your pocket as you're going around uh, along and you can either leave a voice memo for the entire book club to absorb. You can text. If you're not comfortable talking in front of people, you can text it into the, the digest that everybody is getting through the app. You can also add attachments, pictures, videos, links to other resources. That sounds like a small thing, but it's really big when you think about it. The ability to participate how and whenever you want. Because this enabled the book study that I was involved in to have people from all over the globe participate. We had members from India and every time zone in the United States. And those people who prefer to read at 12 o'clock in the morning and give their thoughts as they're reading their book, you can do that in the Voxer application. Additionally, book clubs often fall short because they fail to return on that investment. We're spending the time, but we're not always getting out some life lesson. Great thing about Voxer is that ability to provide other resources. When you're in a book club and there's structured discussion questions, a lot of times it it feels like it's canned, it feels like there's an expectation of what you're supposed to have, and, and that's all you get. But with Voxer, you can pull things from all over the place. For instance, I was out on a jog shortly after the election in 2016, and I was listening to a, an app, a podcast rather, and in that podcast, there was a discussion about Hillary Clinton's campaign slogan. She said, you know, it's amazing. I had three different groups of people working on my campaign slogan. And all three groups came back to me with the same campaign slogan. I was currently reading Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, and I thought, that's, that's groupthink. That's groupthink. I've got to stop jogging, pull over, and share this with my fellow readers. That resource is still available today to those who read Mindset with me in the Boxer application. That's another way that it continues to give back and allows you to take a book club to the next level, being a book study. Because you continually can not only refer back to it, but say a year later, you have the opportunity to share additional insights. Now you may be asking, I surveyed the group through email, there were two questions. One was, what book would you like to read with other people? And the other was, how many books have you read in the last year? I haven't spoken to the first question yet, and I'll just leave it out there that that might have been a plant for a Toastmasters book study coming to a Toastmasters book <laughs> near you. <laughs> Negotiate the best outcome, five, seven minutes, and title is Learning How to Manage Conflict. Real quick before I start, I messed up, and it's actually just negotiating conflict. It's not getting the best outcome. Uh -huh. When I was younger, my brother and I used to fight all the time. It was unbearable for everybody around us. <laughs> Our favorite form of mediation was with this fight, with punch, of course, insulting each other with words like bozo, stupid, and ugly. This probably went on from the time I was five to about 15. When I was younger, I looked down on my brother, and around 16, I started <laughs> my brother, and I started getting my butt kicked. <laughs> 
I got older, while I stopped fighting and punching him, and I never really punched other people, I didn't change about how I'd address people in conflicts. And I was also often very abrasive, argumentative, and I would sometimes yell at random people, which you can imagine is not the best way to solve conflicts. And this would go on to my late teens and early 20s. When I was 22, I started dating my current girlfriend. My girlfriend at the time was 25, emotionally 35. <laughs> emotionally, I was probably about five. <laughs> now, you can imagine with a serious long-term relationship, you cannot manage that relationship if you cannot properly manage conflicts. It won't be a long-term relationship in that scenario. And through our relationship, I learned a lot about managing conflicts and how to mediate them between me and my girlfriend. One of the first things I learned was always giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. A lot of times when people do something, they're not trying to hurt your feelings. They're not trying to be inconsiderate. They really honestly just don't know. I have a roommate right now, her name is Sarah. Great girl. Sarah doesn't know what an inside voice is. And she likes talking on her phone for three hours every night, I kid you not, to her friend about Nathan, some guy at her work. <laughs> now, I could go and bang on her door and yell at Sarah because I think she's inconsiderate. But I gave Sarah the benefit of the doubt. I know she's not doing it intentionally. And I said, hey, Sarah, I would really appreciate it if you just bring it down a notch. And Sarah has done that for me. I also wear earbuds, which is really, really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> the audio wouldn't. The second thing I learned is while people will do things in conflicts that will upset you, if you can manage your anger and frustration, and if you can communicate people in a way they can understand, it oftentimes resolves the conflict better. If I go up to somebody and I say, what's wrong with you? It's very stressful. It's hard to deal with that. But if I say, hey, I just want you to know this is how that made me feel. And I know you didn't mean to do it on purpose, but I would appreciate if you did not do that. And oftentimes, people will reflect how you speak to them right back at you. So if you yell at them, they will yell back at you. If you speak calmly and quietly when they're yelling at you sometimes, it will bring their voice down a lot. The third thing that I learned, and this is the hardest thing to implement, is seeing it from their perspective. If you can remove your anger, your emotions, and how you feel about something, oftentimes you can understand why they might feel a way or do a certain thing. When my girlfriend and I first started dating, she always wanted me to text her when I got home after leaving her house that I was safe. I live in Urbana. It is a very, very safe neighborhood. <laughs> I go for runs at 12 o'clock at night, never worry, nobody gets hurt. And I found it really annoying. And we would have discussions about how annoying that was. <laughs> but I started really thinking about it. Why does she want to know I'm safe? Because she cares about me. And while it does take a little bit of effort on my part, it makes her feel a lot better knowing that I'm home, safe, Another way to address this, potentially find a third party, but tell them the argument from your opponent's perspective. So you get an honest feedback about that discussion. And take what they say to you and maybe implement that when you're going and discussing with the person the conflict. If you tell that person that you understand them, they are far more likely to reciprocate without you and have a settlement in the argument. Ideally a win-win situation. So the last couple years with my girlfriend, I had definitely emotionally toured a little bit. I say we don't really have arguments anymore, and now they are amicable discussions. We're always looking for a win-win situation. So I would suggest to anyone here that you should try some of these at any point this week in your life and see how they work for you.